Good evening everybody. Um, I want to talk today about Muhammad and the Satanic Verses. Um, I've got an article here and what I want to say is that the Satanic Verses is a real event that happened during the lifetime of Muhammad and it's one of the most embarrassing events in Muhammad's life and this happened when Satan put the words, put his words in Muhammad's mouth. Muhammad spoke Satan's words as the word of God. This event is documented by several early Muslim scholars and it's referenced in Hadith and in the Quran. Later on, Muslims were ashamed that their self-declared prophet spoke Satan's words, denied the event occurred, and a myriad of excuses and denials have been put forth by these later Mohammedans to cover up to cover up Muhammad's sinful error. So I just want to point out that the Satanic Verses is not an event that's made up by someone or by non-Muslims. This event is actually recorded by the earliest Islamic sources available on Muhammad's life. Okay, no one should think that it is a story made up by people who are critical of Islam. It is an episode directly found in the early Islamic records. And this topic is one of the most controversial in Islam. Satan calls Muhammad to recite his words as God's words. The background to this event is that Muhammad and his followers were being persecuted for attacking the pagan faith of Mecca. And he did not want to offend his Arab tribesmen and he wanted them to become his followers, i.e. Muslims. He wanted them to become Muslims. In fact, Muhammad wished that God would not reveal anything further to him that would further alienate his fellow Arabs. So when the opportunity arose, he spoke what Satan put into his heart and mind as God's word. So in the Old Testament, if someone caused the people to worship other gods, he was put to death. Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 to 5. So if prophets or those who divine by dreams appear among you and promise you omens or portents, and the omens or the portents declared by them take place, and they say, Let us follow other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You must not heed the words of those prophets or those who divine by dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. But those prophets or those who divine by dreams shall be put to death having spoken treason against the Lord your God so you shall purge the evil from your midst and this is exactly what Muhammad did he advocated the worship of pagan deities as intercessors with God later after Muhammad admitted his mistake and he took back the words he had the audacity to say that God made light of the event God has never made light of sin or false prophets. Think about it. Which of the Old Testament prophets ever spoke the words of Satan? Did Moses speak the words of Satan? Did Ezekiel speak the words of Satan? Did Jeremiah speak the words of Satan? Did Isaiah? None of them. But they, these prophets love their people. And they persisted in speaking the truth to them, not compromising the word of God to gain peace and converts as Muhammad did. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you the evidence, I'm going to give you the proof as well. So Muslims frequently use the phrase, bring forth the proof. Well, the proof is presented here. This event, the Satanic Verses, is documented by the four early biographies Bi biographical writers of Muhammad's life Ibn Ishaq Waqidi Ibn Said and Tabari the Hadith and Quran also contain direct references and additionally several other Islamic scholars on Hadith support the event's occurrence so one Islamic book 
on Muhammad's life provides the following lists. Okay. Many of the traditionalists have recorded it with reference to the chains of its narrators. Among them more commonly known are Al-Tabari, Ibn Abi Hatim, Ibn Al-Mundi, Ibn Maduya, Ibn Ishaq, Musa Ibn Uqba and Abu, Abu Masyar. It is all the more strange that Ibn Hajar, a recognised authority on traditions, insists on the truth of this report and says, as we have mentioned above, the three of its chains of narrators satisfy the conditions requisite for an authentic report. I found four of the early Islamic biographical sources for this story in English. Therefore, prior to a discussion and analysis of the event, the writing should be reviewed. What first follows are the four accounts related from the first four early sources. So, number one is Tabari's History, published by Sunni and translated by Watt. The Kitab, the Kitab al Tabaka al Kabir. The Book of the Major Classes, translated by S. Monul. And then we've got the Surah Rasula, Rasula, The Life of Allah's Prophet by Ibn Ishaq, translated by A. Gulalum. Wakidi's biographical material, Muhammad, also includes the story of Muhammad speaking Satan's words. We've not been able to find Wakidi's entire work in English. But Wakidi's work is quoted by W. Muir in The Life of Mamomet. So additional sporting evidence will be provided from the Sahih Hadith of Bukhari. And finally verses from the Quran will be provided as concurring evidence that Muhammad spoke the Quranic verses. Okay. So the first one is Tabari. Volume 6, page 107. So Satan cast the false revelation on the messenger of God's tongue. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to put the banner in there so you can actually see. Just give me one second. So I'll quote the reference so you can actually see for yourself. And you can actually check it out. So this is the first reference that I'm bringing here and it should flash up on the screen in a second after I've typed it in. So I will be documenting everything that I mention, it won't be just my own opinion but I'll actually provide the sources. Okay, 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 okay. That's the source, that's the first source, source that I'm mentioning. And you can check that out yourself. Okay. So, the messenger of God was eager for the welfare of his people and wished to effect a reconciliation with them in whatever ways he could. It is said that he wanted to find a way to do this and what happened was as follows. Ibn Humaid Salama Muhammad Ishaq Yazid Ziyad al Madini Muhammad Kab al Karazi. When the Messenger of God saw how his tribe turned their backs on him and was grieved to see them shunning the message he had brought to them from God. He longed in his soul that something would come to him from God, which would reconcile him with his tribe. With his love for his tribe and his eagerness for their welfare, it would have delighted him if some of the difficulties which they made for him could have been smoothed out. And he debated with himself and fervently desired such an outcome. Then God revealed, by the star, when it sets, your, when it sets, your comrade does not err, nor is he deceived, nor does he speak out of his own desire. And when he came to the words, 
and I'm going to refer to Surah, you'll find this, these words in Surah 53, 19 to 20. Have you thought upon Alat and Aluza and Manat, the third, the other? Okay. So in Tabari, he mentions that Quranic verse, which is Surah 53, 19 to 20. Okay. So I'll put that on the screen so you can actually look at it yourself. And if you read Tabari's volume 6 of Tabari, page 107, he quotes this Quranic verse, just to be sure. Okay. So I'm actually bringing sources. So it's not my own opinion. This is Islamic sources, by the way, that I'm bringing. Okay. So if you just look on the screen now. Um, okay. And it comes on. <laughs> mm, it's strange. Just give me one second. Having a few technical issues, as they say. Okay. Nineteen. Okay, there's the surah. Okay, there it is. Now, Satan cast on his tongue because of his inner debates and what he desired to bring to the, his people the words. These are the high flying cranes. Verily, their intercession is accepted with approval. So, when the Qureshi heard this, they re rejoiced and they were happy and they delighted at the way in which he spoke of their gods and they listened to him. While the Muslims, having complete trust in their prophet in respect of the messages which he brought from God, did not suspect him of error, illusion or mistake. When he came to the prostration... Having completed the surah, he prostrated himself, and the Muslims did likewise, following their prophet, trusting in the message which he had brought, and following his example. These, those polytheists of the Quraysh, and others who were in the mosque, likewise prostrated themselves because of the reference to their gods, which they had heard, so that there was no one in the mosque believer or unbeliever who did not prostrate himself. The one exception was Al-Walid B and Al-Mughira, who was a very old man and could not prostrate himself, but he took a handful of soil from the valley in his hand and bowed over that. Then they all dispersed from the mosque. The Quraysh left delighted by the mention of their gods, which they had he heard say Muhammad has mentioned our gods in the most favourable way. Possibly stating his, in his recitation they are the high flying, high flying cranes and that their intercession is received with approval. Now look at, look at the implication of this, right? Muhammad is meant to be a prophet of God to bring the message of monotheism, one God, okay? And Muhammad is now bowing down to these, into these, these idols, these three idols, which are Alat, Aluza, and Manat. Okay, so these are idols. Muhammad is bound down to them. So, we'll read on. So, the news of the prostration reached those of the messenger of God's companion, who were in Abyssinia, and people said, The Quraysh have accepted Islam. Some rose up to return, while others remained behind. Then Gabriel came to the messenger of God and said, Muhammad, what have you done? You have recited to the people that which I did not bring to you from God. And you have said that which was not said to you. Then the messenger of God was much grieved and feared God 
greatly, but God sent down a revelation to him, for he was merciful to him, consoling him and making the matter light for him, inform him that there had never been a prophet or a messenger before him who desired as he desired and wished as he wished, but that Satan had cast words into his recitation as he had cast words on Muhammad's tongue. Then God cancelled what Satan had thus cast and established his verses by telling him that he was like other prophets and messengers and revealed. Never did we send a messenger or a prophet before you, but that when he recited the message, Satan cast words into his recitation. God abrogates what Satan cast. The God established his verses. God is Noah wise. And that is in Surah 22, verse 52. Okay? So, I'll just put that on the screen so that you can actually see. Okay. Surah 22, verse 52. Okay. Just bear me one second. I get the hang of this typing. Okay. Okay, if you look on the screen, I've put S2252, which is Surah5252. Okay. There you go. So when Muhammad brought a revelation from God cancelling what Satan had cast on the tongue of his prophet, the Qurayshi said, Muhammad has repented of what he said concerning the position of your gods with God and has altered it and brought something else. These two phrases which Satan had cast on the tongue of the messenger of God were in the mouth of every polytheist and they became even more ill disposed and more violent in their persecution of those of them who had accepted Islam and followed the messenger of God. Those are the companions of the messenger of God who had left Abyssinia upon hearing that Quraysh had accepted Islam by prostrating themselves with the messenger of God now approached. When they were near Mecca, they heard that the report that the people of Mecca had accepted Islam was false. Not one of them entered Mecca without obtaining protection or entering secretly. Among those who came to Mecca and remained there until they emigrated to al Madinah and were present with the Prophet at Badr were from the Banu Abu Shams, Abu Manaf, Qawas, Uthman. Afamfan, Abi al Asbi, Umiya, accompanied by his wife, Rukra. I'm sorry if I'm slaughtering the Arabic names here, but I'm not a native speaker. The daughter of the Messenger of God, Abu Hud Yafa, Uqba Rabaya, Abd Shams, accompanied by his wife, Sah Salah together with a number of others numbering 33 blokes. That evening, Gabriel came to Muhammad and he reviewed the surah. And with him, and when he reached the two phrases which Satan had cast upon his tongue, he said, I did not bring you these two. Then the messenger of God said, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. Then God revealed to him, and they indeed strove hard to beguile you away from what we have revealed to you, that you should invent other than against it. And to the words, and you would have found no helper against us. Muhammad remained grief-stricken and anxious until the revelation of the verse. 
Surah 22, 52 again. Never did we send a messenger or a prophet before you to the words, God is Noah wise. So when those who had emigrated to Abyssinia heard that all the people of Mecca had accepted Islam, they returned to their clan saying, They are more dear to us, but they found that the people had reversed their decision when God cancelled what Satan had cast upon the messenger of God's tongue. Just think of the implications of this, okay? Muhammad has received revelation from Satan telling him to bow down to free pagan deities in Mecca, okay? And then Gabriel has spoken to Muhammad and said, I never did this, it was Satan. And he said to Muhammad, don't worry about it, it's happened before to other messengers. Satan's done this before. So how do we know that that message that came from Gabriel is not coming from Satan again. And if Muhammad is receiving revelation from the devil, why didn't Allah stop it and say no straight away? Why afterwards? It's very, very suspicious. Now let me tell you this, there's not one messenger, not one prophet in the Bible has ever had Satan cast his word. Not one prophet in the Bible that's prophesied has spoken the word of the devil. Always spoken the word of God. Okay? And there's no abrogation in the Bible. So this is completely wrong. I'm gonna read on a bit more because this is a topic that Muslims ignore or they brush it under the carpet. Okay. So I'm going to read Ibn Ishaq. Sirat Rasula, translated as The Life of Muhammad by A. Gulum, pages 165 to 167. Okay. Now the Apostle was anxious for the welfare of his people, wishing to attract them as far as he could. It has been mentioned that he longed for a way to attract them. And the method he adopted is what Ibn Hamid told me that Salama said. Ishaq told him from Yazid, Ziyad of Medina from Kab el Karazi, when the Apostle saw what his people turned their backs on him, and he was pained by their estrangement from what he brought them from God. He longed that there should come to him from God a message that would reconcile his people to him. Because of his love for his people and his anxiety over them, it would delight him if the obstacle that made his task so difficult, difficult could be removed, so that he meditated on the project and longed for it, and it was dear to him. Then God sent down by the star, When it says your comrade is not and is not deceived, he speaks not from his own desire, and when he reached his words, it says this, Have you thought of Alat and al and Manat the third, the other? Satan, when he was mediating upon it and desiring to bring reconciliation, put upon his tongue, These are the exalted Ganaric, whose intercession is approved. When Quraysh heard that they would heard this, they were delighted and greatly pleased at the way in which he spoke of their gods. And they listened to him while the believers were holding what their prophet brought from their Lord was true, not suspecting a mistake or a vain desire or a slip. And when he reached the prostration and the end of the surah in which he prostrated himself, the Muslims prostrated themselves when their prophet prostrated confirming what he brought and obeying his command and the polytheists of Quraysh and others who were in the mosque prostrated when they heard the mention of their gods. 
so that everyone in the mosque, believer and unbeliever, prostrated except Al-Wahid Al Mukira, who was an old man who could not do so. Okay. So, so the Qureshi were surprised and delighted with his acknowledgement of their deities, and as Muhammad, Muhammad wound up the story with the closing words, Wherefore bow down before God and serve him. The whole assembly prostrated themselves with one accord on the ground, and worshipped Walid alone, the son of Mukira, unable from the infirmities of age to bow down, took a handful of earth and worshipped, pressing it to his forehead. And all the people were pleased at which Muhammad had spoken, and they began to say, Now we know that it is the Lord alone that gives life and takes it away, that created and supports. These our goddesses make intercession with him for us, and as thou hast conceded unto them a portion, we are content to follow thee. But their words disquieted Muhammad, and he returned to his house. In the evening, Gabriel visited it, and the prophet recited the surah unto him. And Gabriel said, What is this thou hast done? Thou hast repeated before the people words that I never gave unto thee. So Muhammad grief saw and feared the Lord greatly, and he said, I have spoken of God that which he has not said. But the Lord comforted his prophet and restored his confidence, and cancelled the verse, and revealed the true reading therefore, as it now stands namely. And see ye not Lat and Oza and Manat the third beside? What shall there be male? Progeny unto you and female unto him that were indeed an unjust partition they are nothing but names which ye and your fathers have invented wow so it looks from these accounts that Muhammad did not want to further offend the Meccans and he did not want God to reveal something to him that would cause further offence Muhammad desired a revelation that would bring peace between he and the Meccans when Muhammad began to recite the chapter called The Star, Satan interjected some words and thoughts into Muhammad's heart and mind. This was coupled with Muhammad's own desires, thus Muhammad spoke Satan's words. Later, Gabriel rebuked Muhammad for having spoken Satan's words. Muhammad admitted his sinful error and was then comforted by Allah. So, I'm going to give you some evidence from a Sahih Hadith that Muhammad spoke the Satanic verses. These are references to this event found in Bukhari. Although the actual Satanic verses are not recorded by, Kari, recorded by Bukhari, part of the event is related. And it's a 6.385 narrated Ibn Abbas. The Prophet performed a prostration when he finished reciting Surah and Najim and all the Muslims and pagans and jinns and human beings prostrated along with him. What is of note is that the hadith states that after Muhammad spoke the star, the pagans prostrate, prostrated. This is what exactly what the four biographers state. Remember the pagans were totally opposed to Muhammad they disliked him, he frequently insulted their faith. Yet here, something Muhammad said caused them to prostrate with him and the Muslims in one accord. Muhammad had said something persuasive to move them to bow in worship. Of course, it was the satanic verses. There is no allusion to anything else in the biographical material. Neither is anything specifically recorded in Sahih Hadith or the Quran that refers to other than the satanic verses event. Note how this hadith lines up with the four biographies. And it's even in the Quran. Three passages in the Quran that reference the event. These passages are recorded in the biograph biographical material. The first is the actual passage found in chapter 53 called the Star, which is An-Najam. 
verses 19 through 26. This passing I've already mentioned. Okay. The, like I said, so the second passage is in chapter 22 called the Pilgrimage Al Hajj. So it's Surah 22 verses 52 <coughs> to 53. And it says this, Never have we sent a single prophet or apostle before you with whose wishes Satan did not tamper. But God abrogates the interjections of Satan and confirms his own revelations. God is all-knowing and wise. He makes Satan's interjections a temptation for those whose hearts are diseased, whose hearts are hardened. The third passage is chapter 17 called The Night Journey. Al Isra. So it's chapter 17, verses 73 to 75. They sought to entice you from our revelations. They nearly did, hoping that you might invent some other scripture in our name and thus become their trusted friend. Indeed, had we not strengthened your faith, you might have made some compromise with them and thus incurred a double punishment in this life and in the next. And you should have found none to help you against us. So all of these verses are mentioned in the biographical material. All of them were revealed in relation to Muhammad speaking Satan's words. Note how Tabari records Muhammad's admittance of sin and repentance after Gabriel confronted him with his error. Afterwards, God supposedly comforts Muhammad with the verses from chapter 17 and 22. Ibn Said records the same sequence of, a, se, sequence of verses after he... After he admitted his sinful error, Muhammad was comforted by Gabriel. Who was this Gabriel? So I'm going to read an Islamic scholar's commentary of, the, of Tasfiyah. And one of the greatest Islamic scholars who wrote a Tasfiyah was Zamak Ashari. He commented on this event as well. Here is his writings quoted from the Quran and its exegesis by Helmut. Gatji, pages 53, 55, published by One World, Oxford, England. The faithful rendering of the revelation, Zamak Shari on Surah 22, 52, 51. We have never sent any messenger of prophet before thee, but that Satan cast into his fancy when he was fancying, but God annuls what Satan cast. Then God confirms his signs. Surely God is all-knowing, all-wise. Well, he certainly wasn't all-knowing, all-wise when Satan decided to cast um, scripture to Muhammad and Muhammad believing it to be from Allah. He wasn't all-wise then and all-knowing to prevent that. Okay. The occasion of the sending down of the present verse is the following. As the members of the tribe of the messenger of God turned away from him, and took their stand against him and his relative and his relatives also opposed him and refused to be guided by what he brought to them then as a result of the extreme exasperation concerning their estrangement and as a result of the eager desire and longing that they be converted to Islam the messenger of God sheltered the wish that nothing would come down to him that could make them shy away perhaps he should have been able to use that for the purpose of converting them and causing them to be dissuaded from their error and obstinacy. Now this wish continued in him until the surah, called the star, that is, surah 53, came down. At that time, he found himself with this wish in his heart regarding the members of his tribe. Then he began to recite, and when he came to God's words, and Manat, the third and other, surah 53, 20, Satan substituted something in accordance with the wish which the messenger of God had sheltered. That is, he whispered something to him which would enable the messenger to announce his wish. In an ad inadvertent and misleading manner, his tongue hurried on ahead of him so that he said, These goddesses are the exalted cranes. Their, interse their intercession with God is to be hoped for. Yet the messenger of God was not clear at this point until the protection of God, Isma, reached him and he then became attentive again. Some say that Gabriel drew his attention to it or that Satan himself spoke these words and brought them to the people's hearings. As soon as the messenger of God prostrated for prayer, as the end of the surah, all who were present did it with him and felt pleased. 
That is the unbelievers felt pleased with their goddesses had been accepted as intercessors with God. So I'll point it out again. The satanic verses event is not something made up by non-Muslims. This event is recorded by the early Islamic sources available on Muhammad's life. And these men were devout Muslim scholars. They spent their lives studying, analysing, writing about Muhammad and Islam. They were real Islamic scholars, unlike today's amateur Islamic scholars, like Ahmed Dida and Jamal uh, Baydawai. Also, these sources provide chains of narration, Isnad, showing that the event is traceable to the earliest Muslims. So, they have chains of narration, okay? And Muslims talk about chain of narration, that's how they trace things back, chains of narration. So, regarding these early Islamic scholars, William Muir writes in The Life of Muhammad, that pious Muslims of after days scandalised at the lapse of their prophet into so fragrant a concession to idolatry would reject the whole story. But the authorities are too strong to be impunged. It is hardly possible to conceal, conceive how the tale, if not founded in truth, could ever have been invented. So one of the terms Muhammad used to describe the pagan goddesses was Manat, Uzza and Allah. And this was Galenik, translated as High Flying Cranes. So in Muhammad and the Religion of Islam by John Gilchrist, published by Jesus to the Muslims, page 118, Gilchri Gilchrist writes, The Arabic word Ganarig refers to certain cranes which fly at a great height. The pagan Meccans, impressed by the splendour of these birds, Therefore, describe their goddesses by an analogous reference to them. When Muhammad quoted the very used word used by the Meccans to exalt their goddesses, they said to one another, Muhammad has spoken of our gods in excellent fashion. So think about this, folks. Muhammad has come to bring the message of monotheism. And they're saying Muhammad has spoken of their pagan deities, their gods, they call them, in an excellent fashion. Muhammad has compromised the message of monotheism. Just bear that in mind. In the area, there were cranes that flew at high, high altitudes. It was quite logical for Muhammad to thus describe the idols as high flying, metaphorically flying in the heavens close to Allah to act as intercessors. Another note of interest, Muhammad claimed that his Quran was above human invention. He challenged anyone, including the jinns, to produce something like the Quran. Well, we see that Satan was able to do this, as you can see from the sources that I've quoted. Gabriel had to confront Muhammad with the fact that those satanic verses were not Allah's words. And no, all of the Muhammadans, Muhammad, Muhammad's followers, also prostrated when Muhammad prostrated. They did not realise that a false Quran had been spoken. Obviously, this Quran is not that special. Even Satan was able to bring forth similar material. So the challenge of, of the Muslims to bring a, a surah like it has been met by Satan himself. So many Muslims today are embarrassed and ashamed that the man they follow was used by Satan to speak Satan's words. It is understandable that Muslims are ashamed. I mean, what kind of prophet speaks the words of the devil? So, let's look at some of their arguments. So, one writer, MSN Safula, Quasim Iqbal. So, here's the argument what he's put forward. The fundamentalist Muslim usually complain about someone criticising their religion and to cover the weakness of their position. They personally attack Christians or others who put forth the criticism. So to start with, they complain about Christians identifying Muhammad with the beast of Revelation 13. Here is their first complaint. The word Mamitus means the number of the beast, i.e. 666, by which Muhammad was known in the Middle Ages. The names Mahum and Mahound refer to Muhammad. 
and they say it was imagined by credulous Europeans to be a pagan god. These derogatory names were concocted by love thy neighbour, turn thy cheek Christians, who maintained an open policy of defamation against Islam and Muhammad throughout the Middle Ages. Apparently this policy still exists today, though in a more sophisticated apparatus. So, I'm going to respond to that and say this. Shouldn't a false prophet be pointed out? If a man speaks the words of Satan as God, shouldn't this be revealed? Shouldn't people need, people need to know about this? Further, Islam denies the sonship, the crucifixion, the messiahship, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This should be, shouldn't this be exposed? Additionally, didn't Muhammad order that all Jews and Christians be driven out of the Hijaz, i.e. the land where Muhammad lived? Didn't Muhammad have 800 males, some as young as 12, massacred? Didn't Muhammad allow the rape of slaves? Didn't Muhammad torture, torture a man just to obtain money? Didn't Muhammad order the deaths of female slaves for just mocking him? So then, to equate this evil man with the beast of revelation is no stretch. While it may offend Muslims, I encourage all Muslims to take a deeper look at the man they follow. I encourage all sincere Muslims to re-examine a man upon whom they are staking their eternity. I have examined Muhammad and I find him evil. I find him as the greatest false prophet in history. So, another Muslim, funda Muslim fundamentalist also tried to make out seem that only one man transmitted the event of the satanic verses. This is what they say. It would not be difficult to understand given the fact that the so-called satanic verses were transmitted from al-Waqidi to Ibn Said, Ibn Said, who was the secretary of al-Waqidi. Al In other words, neither al-Waqidi nor Ibn Said were eyewitnesses to the revelation of satanic verses. They were simply the transmitters. Claiming that the issue of so-called satanic verse incident is true just because Al-Tabari or Ibn Said mentioned them amounts to a deliberate distortion of the facts. My response to this is this. It is not a deliberate distortion of the facts. First of all, the story is transmitted by the four early biographers of Muhammad's lives. Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, Ibn Said and Tabari. Ibn Said did not use... Wikidi's material, but he also was a scholar in his own right and did a great deal of research. Didn't he write a 15 volume book on the early Muslims? Ibn Said was much more than just a mere copyist. Tabari used Ibn Ishaq's materials as well as Wikidi's and others, but Tabari did not simply write anything he came across. He too was more than a mere copyist. Tabari was one of the greatest scholars of Islam. He wrote a 39 volume history mostly related to Islam, as well as a thorough commentary, Tasfir, on the Quran. Obviously, Tabari thought that the story had enough merit to be included in his writings. Additionally, there is corroborative material in both the Sahih Hadith and Quran supporting the story. Therefore, no facts have been distorted. These men were reputable Islamic scholars. They rank among the greatest in Islamic history. To say that the story is true based upon what they wrote is no distortion. There is nothing in the Quran or Hadith contradicting the story. So look at your early sources and read what they say. Other, other fundamentalist Muslims try to discredit the event by saying that the verses in the Quran related to the event were revealed at a much later date than the incident occurred. So here's the argument. The verses of Surah Al-Izra 17, 73 to 5, which were revealed according to the story to admonish the Prophet for allegedly reciting the satanic verses. In fact, were not revealed until after the event of Miraj, the Miraj or the ascent of the Prophet according to historical sources occurred in the 10th or 11th year of the prophetic call, i.e. two or three years before the Hiraj to Medina. If this is so, then it implies that the satanic verses were not detected or for some reason no mention was made about the alleged interpolation of the verses for five or six years 
and only afterwards was the prophet admonished for it. Can any sensible person believe that the interpolation occurs today, while the admon admonition takes place six years later, and the abrogation of the interpolated verses are publicly announced after nine years? So, this argument rests upon the chronological time of the revelation of verses 17, 73 to 75. The early Muslim sources, Tabari and Ibn Said, say these verses were revealed around the time the satanic verses were spoken by Muhammad, not at the time of the Miraj. So additionally, the Quran is haphazardly composed. Verses that Muhammad spoke in Medina were mixed in with verses that he spoke in Mecca. Frequently, Muhammad told that told that verses he spoke at one time were to be recited with verses revealed at a much earlier time. To this day, Islamic scholars have not been able to determine a unified chronological sequence of the revelation of the Quran's chapters. While there are certain portions that, that can be put in some logical sequence, much of its chronology is indeterminate. The Quran is a hodgepodge of verses that have been spliced together. So to base an argument on the supposed chronicle order of the Quran is akin to building a house upon sinking sand it cannot stand. So this complaint, denial, argument has been defeated by John Kilchrist in Muhammad and the religion of Islam. And I quote page 120. The other argument is weak in that there is no concrete proof that the first part of Surah 53 refers to the mirage which followed the emigration to Abyssinian. As shown already, it almost certainly refers to one of Muhammad's initial visions, limited by the Quran itself to the two he had when his ministry began. Unfortunately, one finds that virtually all Muslim arguments of a factual nature against this story are equally weak. Gilchrist goes on to quote Bell on the composition of the Quranic verse, 22, 51-53. This surah has been become quite disjointed. This address to the Prophet personally are quite out of connection. This is by Bell, the Quran translated, volume 1, page 316. So, so the conclusion is this. The evidence proves Muhammad spoke the satanic verses. And the ramifications are large. Muhammad had a strange relationship with Satan. Was it really Gabriel choking Muhammad in the cave? How many other words were influenced by Satan? Why would God make light of a prophet speaking Satan's words as God's? Didn't God command in the Old Testament that false prophets should be put to death? Didn't Jesus predict that false prophets would come and mislead many? Matthew 24 verse 11. So, Matthew 24 verse 11 says this, and I'll read it, because this is important, because Jesus knew after him there would be many false prophets. This is what it says in Matthew 24 11. He says, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Many false prophets. I'm going to put the verse up here because this is important. Okay. Let's add a verse. Okay. So if you read the Bible, Matthew 24. Verse 11. Okay. So if you just look on the bottom screen there, that's the Bible verse warning about false prophets. And what I'm going to do as well, I'm going to put another verse up here that tells you what happened, what God does to false prophets.
So I'll just put it up here now. Deuteronomy 13. I'm going to read it as well because it's important. This. So if you look at the bottom screen, I'm going to read this passage as well. Deuteronomy 13. So God wouldn't make light of, of this kind of thing. It says here, If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to work the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him. Now Muhammad wasn't obeying God's voice. He was listening to the voice of the devil according to the sources. Okay? And he went, what did he say? He says, let us go after other gods. Those three pagan deities that I mentioned, they were other gods, idol idols. And the Bible says, we're not to listen to that prophet. This is the book, folks, to read the Holy Bible. And it warns about false prophets. Muhammad is a false prophet. And we're to ignore what he says. I'm going to read the Bible, which is full of prophecy. Thank you for listening. God bless you.